Cool. Hello, um, my name is Tom Webb. I'm a postdoc at the University of York studying the coastal cryosphere. And um, I first want to welcome you to the Cryosphere Pavilion and this event, which is on why the West Antarctic is so important to near-term sea level rise. I also want to welcome those of you who are tuning in virtually uh, at Cryosphere Hubs in Geneva and also in Stockholm. You will have the chance to pose questions in the chat or for some of you at the hubs directly in the, to, the, um, to the speakers during the question and answer session. I'd now like to hand you over to John Bamba from the University of Bristol. Hi there, everyone. Uh, well, thanks very much for coming along. Um, oh, is that too loud? <laughs> Apologies. Um, I'm losing my voice, so see how it goes. Uh, my name is Jonathan Bamber. I'm director of the Bristol Glaciology Centre, um, obviously in the UK, but I'm also a professor at the Technical University of Munich in Germany. And I just want to give you a kind of um, an overview of the state of the art and why we're particularly concerned about the West Antarctic ice sheet and what it may do over, by near term, we mean really the next century. Um, but I'm going to be slightly cheeky because I've got the mic <laughs> and throw in um, some other kind of wild cards in terms of uh, sea level rise over the next century and other things that we, we might want to be concerned about. Uh, just start with um, kind of my favorite cartoon about climate change and, you know, the, the battle we, we've had over so many years um, uh, in, in communicating the fact that this actually is an emergency um, and, you know, that we, we, can't, we can't sort of really afford to listen to, in, um, well, convenient lies anymore. Um, and uh, actually, I showed this in a, a, a session earlier on, which was um, sea level rise, committed sea level rise, and, and uh, young people and, 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 you know, their reaction to the changing world that they're going to inhabit because of, really because of the, the, the things that my generation have done, you know, really over the last 50 years. Um, and, you know, I think... If you had to paraphrase, I think that that cue of people for a convenient lie is is people of my generation. And you know, if there was a cue for the other film, it would be the younger generation. And I think there's an interesting contrast there. But anyway, um, I'll, uh, I was going to skip this slide because I don't think it's so relevant. Um, this one is. <laughs> This is a slide from a paper by a colleague called Bob Kopp, um, which was published two or three years ago. Um, and it's a reconstruction of sea level over what's called the common era. Common era. It's in fact the last two and a half thousand years. And don't the top plot, the gray line, shows you that sea level reconstruction. And there's two key things to notice or to take note of. That's a reconstruction for two and a half thousand years. Um, Sea level at the present day is higher than it ever has been over that entire period. But more importantly than that is the rate. The gradient of that curve for the last few decades is steeper than it ever has been over the last two and a half thousand years. And the bottom plot shows the temperature record. And it's not too surprising, you know, it's not rocket science in, in that sense, that the temperature record or at least, sorry, the sea level record mirrors the temperature record um, for, for the last few centuries. So if we carry on increasing temperature, that gradient on the top graph is going to get steeper and steeper. And at the minute, the gradient is, is just about okay for us to adapt to climate change. In other words, to have controlled migration, um, but if it gets too steep, adaptation no longer becomes an option. And you have uncontrolled migration on a scale that we don't really want to think about. Um, okay, so why West Antarctica? 
So this is the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, on the left, the, 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 let, me, let me point. That's West Antarctica. It's 10 times smaller in its total volume than its, its much bigger eastern neighbor. But the reason we're particularly concerned about the West Antarctic ice sheet is that it rests on, on bedrock that is up to two and a half thousand meters, that's two and a half kilometers below sea level. So almost all of it is in contact with the ocean. And as the ocean warms, and in particular, as circulation changes in the Southern Ocean, and warm water um, reaches the continental shelf and the margins of West Antarctica, it's going to erode the underside of this what's called marine ice sheet and invoke um, something called the marine ice sheet instability. That is um, a kind of a theoretical concept that, that glaciologists have known about for about 50 years. And it's something that we're starting to see in the observations. You know, we know that it's more than hypothetical. We've seen it in paleoclimate records. Um, and if temperatures rise beyond a certain threshold, um, then this instability will be invoked and it's unstoppable on human timescales. The Antarctic ice sheet is, if you like, it's the beer moth, the super tanker of the climate world. It, it, once you point it in a certain direction, it will carry on in that direction for thousands of years. And there is absolutely no way that we're going to be able to change that direction once it's kicked off. And so we must do absolutely everything we can to avoid passing that critical threshold, that, that point where we invoke this instability. What happens if we do invoke it? Um, just ignore this. this. This is just to illustrate how big Antarctica is. All of those different things are all to scale. So Greenland is the next biggest ice mass on the planet. It's about the tenth of the size of Antarctica, about the same as West Antarctica. The UK is to scale in that figure. I mean, Antarctica is a big place. It's far away. You know, nobody lives there permanently. So it's very easy to forget. In fact, um, an African delegate who I was speaking to earlier said, well, you know, there's no glaciers in Africa. Why, why do I care about ice? And, um, you know, this is why. Because if you, if you got rid of the Antarctic ice sheet, you'd raise global sea level by 58 meters. And I'll, I'll explain what the consequences of a, a small fraction of that is in, in just a minute. So it's pretty big. It's, it's one and a half times the area of Australia. It's bigger than the conterminous USA. Um, in, in places, the ice is almost five kilometers thick. You know, so it, it's a massive, massive piece of ice. And as I said, you know, once you push it a little bit too far, you push it over a particular threshold, an edge, that's it. It's gonna, it's just, it's, you know, it's gonna carry on doing what it's gonna do uh, for millennia. Just, I don't wanna bombard you with numbers and because, you know, we're all suffering from information overload. I, I absolutely wanna make sure you've got time for questions, but just a few numbers. The two ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, they hold 99.5% of the ice on the planet, the land ice on the planet. So in terms of their sea level contribution, they are the big players. Greenland, 7.4, SLE stands for sea level equivalent. So Greenland has enough ice to raise sea level by 7.4 meters. West Antarctica is five. East Antarctica is 58. Um, oh, sorry, 53, 53. Why am I not concentrating on East Antarctica in this talk? That's because the vast majority of the East Antarctic ice sheet, um, it 
doesn't have this geometry, which means that it's potentially unstable. Parts of it do, but they are they are buttressed by um, ice, which is above sea level, and so is not affected by oceanic erosion. It's the West Antarctic Ice Sheet that over the next century is this kind of massive question mark over our, our future on the planet, our, our coastal future on the planet. Um, and just to put some of those numbers into a kind of human context, a two meter sea level rise, which is plausible by 2100, if we carry on on our current greenhouse gas emission pathway, which we call business as usual, that's no, no, no mitigation, you know, no reductions, you know, we carry on increasing emissions, then two meters is possible by 2100. That is going to displace 630 million people around the world. Um, that's a tenth of the population of the planet. Um, it's 150. <clears throat> Give me. A That's better. It's 150 times more people than the Syrian refugee crisis that took place from 2010 to 2017. And that caused, you know, quite a lot of political turmoil in Europe. Imagine multiplying that by 150. We're talking about really pretty much um, the breakdown of, you know, kind of civilized society. So these are incredibly serious, incredibly high risk um, consequences that we have to avoid. Um, I think that's enough for me, actually. Uh, uh, I see that our second speaker is now here. Um, so, so I'll hand over to um, my colleague Rob DeConto from University of Massachusetts at Amherst, who has done a lot of work on modeling the ice sheets, both over long time scales, but also looking at ice sheet response to climate forcing in the future. And he's going to say a bit more about um, the science, I think. Two minutes. Oh, quick. Okay. Some questions. Yeah. Helene. Oh, do you want to go up to the mic, please? Okay. Um, Jonathan, a question for you. So in the IPCC report, obviously, we uh, showed that there was deep uncertainty associated with this. And, uh, you know, as you know, you've talked about, but what, and, you know, we completely flagged that Antarctica is a big uncertainty. If you were going to invest a whole load of money, what would you be doing? What would you be putting your money into to reduce that uncertainty? Well, research or early warning systems, observations, models. Uh, that's a great, great question. That was Helene Hewitt, who was a um, coordinating lead author on the latest IPCC report covering this topic. And she wants to know, you know, bang for buck was the question. Where are you going to get the biggest bang for buck in terms of research? Um, and like, I'm, I'm going to give you a politician's answer. I'm not really going to answer the question. Um, I don't think there's any one thing. I think we have to cover all bases. It's just like, just like climate mitigation. You can't rely on any one, one thing. It, it's technology, it's individual action, it's companies, it's everything. And it's the same with the research. I think we have to improve our process understanding. We have to improve um, these climate models that we use to force, they, they have to have improved skill in terms of forcing our ice sheet models. And we have to have a bit, um, okay, so, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, very well known to some of the people here, a guy called Richard Alley, gave a really nice analogy of um, the ice sheet modeling community. So if you're a meteorologist, you know, you have whole institutes, two or 300 scientists working in an institute, working on atmospheric modeling. 
meteorological observations, modeling the atmosphere. Same with oceanography, same with hydrology. You know, there's this beautiful building in, in Boulder, Colorado, called the National Center for Atmospheric Research. It's this massive building where they just look at the atmosphere. Ice sheet modelers, he, he showed this picture of his office. You know, that's it. There's, there's probably a handful, maybe 20 individuals, perhaps 10 groups around the world working on this incredibly difficult but really important problem. So I think, you know, you've got to do all those things. But I think if you invested just a tiny amount of money, actually, relatively speaking, you know, we're talking $100 billion a year for, you know, developing countries, um, tiny fraction of that in um, ice sheet modeling capability, you'd, you'd, you'd um, make really good progress. But also, there are kind of no really shortcuts. You know, I don't think you're not going to get the answers in a year or two years and time is against us. So I think we have to look at alternative approaches. And, and if I was a politician and I was risking, you know, the future of nation states, which is what we're talking about here, I think I would take a precautionary principle. I think it's the only wise thing you can do. Um, yeah. So that's really roundabout answer to a sort of simple question. Thanks. Any other questions yeah. while while Rob is um, we do uh, sort of, I don't know, getting himself you know, warmed up? So, thanks. I would like just to know, so I have not a scientific question, but maybe a policy question. So also considering that the global po population is projected to increase in the next in the next year, what can be some useful like mitigation or adaptations sorry adaptation strategies to uh take in, i mean to uh take into consideration that a lot of people will be affected by this sea level rise and what as western countries we can do to help the most affected countries um so it's a it's a it's a question about adaptation adaptation to sea level rise so one of the things I didn't mention, even if we stop emitting CO2 tomorrow, we are committed to future sea level rise and actually to uh, some acceleration in sea level rise. One thing I forgot to mention is that throughout the 20th century, the rate was about one and a half millimeters a year. It doesn't sound like a lot, you know, it's not so much. But the last decade, it's increased by a factor three, three times more. Um, and it's not going to go down over the next century. That rate is, is very unlikely to decrease, even if we stop emitting tomorrow. So we have to take adaptation measures for um, coastal communities and coastal infrastructure. And there's a lot of things we can do. So the UK government um, at this COP is, is pushing hard for something called MBS, nature-based solutions. And actually, they, they are very effective for um, coastal protection. They, they have multiple benefits. Um, I was talking with someone about, I think, Twilo earlier, seagrass. You know, it absorbs carbon 35 times faster than, than trees. And it's, uh, a, a, you know, it's a useful protection against um, surge tides and um, high level sea stands. Um, other things like mangroves. But you are already coastal communities are having to move inland. Um, if you go to Alaska, there are towns falling into the sea because of permafrost degradation and sea level rise. So those communities are having to adapt now. And I mean, it, it's pretty obvious that, you know, we shouldn't be, shouldn't be building even more um, on, on low-lying coastal um, areas that are susceptible to flooding. It's, it's the same... It's the same as, you know, river floodplains. It's not a smart thing to do. But in a country like the UK, well, particularly in England, you know, there's a real shortage of um, land. Uh, we quite high population density. So you know, there there were no there were no easy solutions, no quick wins with this.
uh, of sea level rise, okay? Like from the, the most optimistic scenarios to the, the worst case scenarios. So how do you transfer the, um, the difference in timing in sea level rise acceleration uh, in the 20, at the end of the 21st century? Like it seems that there is a tipping point between like two, uh, around 250 in the SSP 1.9 scenarios and uh, like 270 threshold in acceleration of sea level rise in the worst case scenario. So how do you transfer this difference of timing to the stakeholders and to the policy makers? <laughs> Sorry, it's a bad question. <laughs> So, um, if you live in the if you live in the UK, you will over the last eighteen months have been subjected to, uh, for for a period at least, daily briefings from our chief scientific advisor and our chief medical officer. And and then after they've said you know things are really bad and you know we need to do this and this is the science. Um, a minister, sometimes it was Boris Johnson, sometimes it was um, a minister, would say, okay, well, there's the science. We, we, we follow or we follow the science or we're led by the science. You know, I think I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass the buck. I'm not going to answer that question directly because I'm not a policymaker. And, you know, policy is about choices and you have to make very difficult choices. Um, you know, you you have a, a finite budget. It was just like Helene's question about where would you spend the money? You can't, you can't do everything. And so I think um, in terms of um, policy decisions, um, look, it's, we know that if we push the climate system too hard, we are gonna pass, um, critical thresholds, not just in the cryosphere, in other parts of the climate system. And as I mentioned, you know, it's not even the precautionary, it's just the sensible policy is not to do that. I, I mean, oh, I can't show it to you now, but that slide that I skipped over with those black lines, that, that the one on the left was the a reconstruction of um, the temperature record uh, for the last 10,000 years. And it's basically a straight line. That's, that has allowed us to develop the society that we live in now. It's allowed us to develop uh, modern agriculture. And we're starting to mess with that straight line. It's not a smart thing to do. Uh, Rob DeConta from the University of Massachusetts. Okay, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to show a few slides I, I used in a talk earlier today, and I'm going to try to build on what Jonathan just talked about in, in Twyla, actually, earlier in the day. So this still, to me, is one of the most important, easy-to-grasp concepts this is a geologist, American colleague, Andrea Dutton. In, um, she's with a, an assistant working in the field. This is in the Seychelles. And you can see some big granite blocks there. And, and Andrea is standing on an ancient coral reef. And the geologists have come up with um, very clever ways to date corals very accurately. So Andrea knows exactly when that coral was living and she knows exactly how high it is relative to 
modern sea level. That's a 128,000 year old coral and it's eight meters above sea level. Here's another roughly 128,000 year old coral. This is in the Florida Keys, about eight meters above sea level. So geologists not only are going out mapping what sea level has been like in the past, but there, um, are, there's complementary science going on where geologists are actually figuring out the temperature of the earth at the time these corals were living, how much, we know how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere because we can drill ice cores that far into the, into the past. And the take home message here is without all the fancy modeling and the, the fancy computers and the, the glaciology that a, a lot of us here speaking do, the message is clear. The ice sheets are sensitive and they're sensitive to a little bit of warming. And if you wait long enough, even with temperatures like we're seeing today, and we think that global mean temperature was about the same when these corals were living eight meters above today's sea level um, 128,000 years ago, that means that the ice sheets are, are, are sensitive. Now, whether or not this is mostly caused by Greenland melting or the West Antarctic ice sheet, we're still trying to figure out just how much each ice sheet contributed. But there have been records now published in the last 10 years that suggest that at the time, at precisely at the time when Andrea is, um, you know, date, has dated these corals, Greenland was not the dominant contributor to this sea level rise. It had to come from someplace else. And of course, the only other source is Antarctica. And the assumption being for the reasons that you just heard about and ones that you'll see again here, likely West Antarctica being the culprit for a lot of this sea level rise. So these records are powerful. They're somewhat uncertain in trying to figure out, you know, this coral might not have, have might have moved up and down, plate tectonics, the, the, the Earth's crust actually goes up and down with something that the geologists call um, 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 dynamic topography. So, you know, it's, it's eight meters plus or minus maybe one and a half meters, but it's still a lot of sea level rise in a world similar to today. Okay, now um, I showed this slide earlier. This is the ice mass loss measured in gigatons. It's a very, very big number for Antarctica and Greenland over the, over the satellite era, roughly. And if these ice sheets, both Greenland and Antarctica were healthy and happy and in equilibrium so that the, the amount of snow falling on the ice sheet and the amount either melting or flowing out into the ocean and then breaking off as icebergs, if those two things were equal, the input from the snow and the output from melt and, and calving, then these would be straight lines, flat lines, horizontal. And you can see they're not, they're not at all. And I think you can all, you know, you don't have to be a statistician to see that there's a little bit of a bend in these curves. There's an acceleration. So the big ice sheets are contributing more and more to sea level every year that goes by. Antarctica is, you can see, it's not losing mass at the same pace as Greenland. It's roughly half, give or take. But if that were to change, that would be a very, very bad thing because of the sheer size of the ice sheet. There's eight times more sea level rise potential locked up in the Antarctic ice sheet than the Greenland ice sheet. And we think that the, the, the sector of the ice sheet that is going to be the, the quickest to respond because we're actually observing it's the place that's responding now is West Antarctica. And you can see that in these maps. So this is, um, this is mass loss in these colors. Blue would be a gain of, of ice and the red colors would be a loss. Greenland's a relatively straightforward story. We know where the ice is being lost. It's around the flanks of the ice sheet. And what's happening is it's pretty simple that every year, right, we have polar amplification. This part of the world is warming at more than two times the pace as the rest of the world. And every summer, 
the temperatures that are above zero are, are climbing higher and higher up the flanks of the sides of the ice sheet, causing more melt. It's surface melt. Something else is going on in, in Antarctica where you see that red bullseye. It's still very cold in the, in the summertime. There's something else going on. There are dynamic processes, the ones that, that Jonathan, I think, talked about, that are, um, there's a big glacier. There, there are two. One is called Thwaites Glacier, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute, and Pine Island Glacier that are responding to, um, to changing conditions there. We think mainly they're responding to an increase in the temperature of the ocean that is in contact with the undersides of these glaciers and their, their buttressing ice shells. Okay, so if this system wakes up, there's roughly between three and four meters of potential sea level rise just in this part of the ice sheet, which we call West Antarctica, the West Antarctic ice sheet. There's much more ice locked up here in the East Antarctic ice sheet. Okay, I showed this slide earlier, and I, I again, I just can't, for those of you who, who didn't see this slide earlier in the day, I was explaining to the audience that, you know, even working on this day in and day out every day, I still, it's like, and having, you know, been there and worked in the field, um, just kind of look, being reminded about this, the scale of the system we're talking about. So here's the West Antarctic ice sheet. You know, it's the size of most of, of Western, um, the Western United States. Huge. Okay, now, um, why West Antarctica versus Greenland is, is also an interesting story in terms of sea level rise, is that whether Greenland ends up being the dominant long-term future contributor to sea level rise or West Antarctica, is going to impact who is the big loser in terms of, um, of coastal impacts. Because sea level rise doesn't happen the same, at the same pace, at the same magnitude, everywhere on the surface of the earth. You'd, you'd think it would because the ocean is fluid and it can move. Um, but the reason has to do basically with gravity. So as the ice sheets lose ice, there's mass that used to be locked up in an ice sheet is now being distributed throughout the world's oceans. And that changes the Earth's gravitational field, even ch changes the Earth's axis of rotation a little bit. It, it pushes or, or lets part of the Earth's crust actually respond. So gravity in these dynamics, these geodynamics, end up being important for the distribution of sea level rise. And these are so-called sea level rise fingerprints that actually do the calculations to figure out if there's X amount of ice lost from the Greenland ice sheet, what does a map of sea level change look like versus a map of sea level change for a given amount of ice lost, in this case, for West Antarctica. So the map on the left is sea level change for a given amount of global average sea level rise coming just from Greenland. Let's say it's one meter. So Greenland loses a lot of ice equivalent to one meter of global average sea level rise. Well, now the Greenland ice sheet is smaller than it used to be. And so it is not pulling on the ocean around itself as well as it used to. It's because it's losing gravity. So really close to the Greenland ice sheet, even though the global average sea level rise has gone up by a meter, right around Greenland in the blue colors, those dark blue colors, believe it or not, sea level drops because this gravitational change actually overcomes the global average sea level change. The, z the, the zero line where you would see no change in the sea levels go up, up or down for ice loss on, on Greenland is basically, um, it's, it's these colors, sort of those where the dark blues are going to, to light blue, basically right through the UK. Now, it doesn't matter if it's one meter or seven meters of ice loss 
from the Greenland ice sheet, that zero line doesn't, doesn't change. So that's really interesting. That means that if the Greenland ice sheet goes into the ocean and causes 7.4 meters of global average sea level rise, the UK is not going to feel a thing. But that means that someplace else in the world has to compensate. So you look far away from Greenland, for example, down in southern South America. Over here, you see some dark red colors. Those are places where the sea level change is more than we expected. You're getting um, more sea level rise than the global average. Now, here's the same sort of scenario for the West Antarctic ice sheet on the right. It's the same story. West Antarctica losing ice. Gravity is changing. It's not pulling on the ocean around itself as, as much as it used to. Sea level is actually dropping in these dark blue colors. You go far away from West Antarctica. For example, there's a big dark red bullseye right around North America. This part of the world feels more sea level rise than the global average if the sea level rise is coming from West Antarctica. And it's a pretty big number, it's 25% uptick. So like where I live, Boston, Boston would feel not one meter of sea level rise because a meter of ice worth of ice was lost from West Antarctica. Boston would feel one and a quarter meters. That's a really, really big difference. Okay, so I, I'm sure is has already been mentioned um, why West Antarctica? West Antarctica because this is a map of what Antarctica looks like if you take the ice sheet away and we just look at the bedrock. The green colors are land that is above sea level and the blues are land that are below sea level. Okay, so West Antarctica, here, there's the West Antarctic ice sheet. You see it's all sitting on blue. And some of those blues are really dark. West Antarctica, Antar Antarctica, the West Antarctic ice sheet is sitting on bedrock. It's essentially a bowl shaped basin that in some places is more than two kilometers, 2000 meters below sea level. So it's a bowl shaped basin where as you go from the edge of the ice sheet into the interior of the ice sheet, the bedrock gets deeper, like a bowl. Okay, and, and that's why um, Jonathan mentioned and described, I think, a potential instability in the ice sheet um, that exists in scenarios like this, where as you go back into the interior of the ice sheet, if the bedrock gets deeper and deeper and deeper as you back up, or if the ice edge starts to retreat and you start going the ice edge is now backing up into the interior of the ice sheet. If the ice gets thicker and thicker and thicker as the ice margin backs up into this bowl, like this, then the ice that goes out into the ocean increases dramatically as the bedrock gets deeper and deeper and deeper. So that would, that would suggest that there could be an instability in the system because just as you start to retreat into deeper bedrock, the ice gets thicker and you start making even more ice go out into the ocean. This is the so-called marine ice sheet instability notion. Now, marine ice sheet instability and another instability that I'll mention as a possibility, a, a, another possible instability in the system, aren't fully widespread all around Antarctica and around like East Antarctica because a lot of the ice in Antarctica that's in contact with the ocean are being essentially protected or supported by ice shelves. And, and little arrows here uh, are pointing to extensions of the ice sheet that are floating tongues of ice that extend out into the Southern Ocean. Okay, and you'll see what, what the role of these really important ice shelves are in just a moment. The, the, this figure is just showing the speed of the flow of the ice in a, in a computer model of the ice sheet. And so we make sure that these computer models of the ice sheet can match the modern geometry and flow and, and dynamics of the ice sheet. That's a good thing. That doesn't mean that the, 
the model is something that we can use to make future projections or predictions, but it's the first step in, in modeling. Can we reproduce the, the modern ice sheet? For the most part, we can. Okay, so these fast flowing regions in red, that is mostly floating, mostly little floating tongues of ice, mostly floating. Okay, they're very thick slabs of floating ice in some places a kilometer thick. And then it, they get a little thinner as you go from the edge of the ice sheet out to the ocean. Eventually they get thin enough. So that's where calving happens or icebergs form. And they icebergs break off the edges of these ice shelves and float out into the Southern Ocean. That's one of the, the, the primary ways the Antarctic ice sheet is losing mass today is, is through calving processes. Now, why, um, and, and Twyla talked about ice shelves earlier today, I know, they're really, really critical. They are the key to Antarctica's future. And their loss really represents a potential tipping point in Antarctica's future and the future of our global coastlines. So here's another cross section of a, let's say a glacier draining a basin of Antarctica. This could be a West Antarctic glacier. And in this case, this is the Thwaites Glacier. This is a glacier that is at its modern grounding line here. So here's the glacier flowing from left to right. Snow is falling on top of the ice sheet. It's flowing under its own weight out toward the sea. It's thinning. At some point, it's no longer grounded onto the bed begins to float. We call that point the grounding line. So everything to the right of the grounding line is an ice shelf. Now, if the ice shelf actually bumps into something like some topographic features on the seafloor, and I've tried to sketch those in like these little funny looking mountains, you see there's some, some topography under the ice shelf poking into its bottom side. That provides some resistance to the flow of the ice upstream. I think you just can intuitively see that, that if, if, if we're poking into the bottom of this and all the flow is from left to right, you're going to provide some resistance to the flow. You're gonna slow the flow and you're also going to provide some structural support for the ice upstream itself at the grounding line. Okay, now if the ice at this grounding line is really, really thick. What will happen is we don't have, we end up having enough of the ice above sea level to a point where if there's enough ice above sea level, you can start per, to produce stresses in the ice that could potentially start to exceed the actual um, material strength of the ice itself and the ice will start to break. And so we're thinking that there could be a second instability in some of these big Antarctic glaciers that are draining West Antarctica that could be, um, that could um, kick in if we lose these buttressing ice shelves. The flow will certainly increase and we're gonna lose the structural support that could allow the breaking of the edge of the glacier itself, calving to increase. Okay, so there's the back stress provided by an ice shelf. You take that ice shelf away, you lose the buttressing. And, you know, as I showed earlier today, it's a pretty in intuitive picture. We have this ice shelf, it's, it's grounded and it's mostly floating, but if it's poking into things on the seafloor, it can provide some back stress support. Okay, now where we have seen ice shelves that used to buttress glaciers flowing from the continent out into the sea, like in this picture. So this is oriented the same way. There's thick ice to the left, and then we see some outlet glaciers flowing out toward the ocean, and they are all coalescing when they hit the sea to form a nice broad ice shelf. This is the Larsen B ice shelf, the way it looked in 2002. Okay, but there's a bunch of dark stuff on this ice shelf in this satellite image. And that dark stuff, this stuff, 
that's water. It's liquid water. And the liquid water is there because it just happens that that summer in Antarctica was warmer than average. And a lot of meltwater was being produced and was accumulating on the ice shelf. And that water got into fractures and crevasses. It moved. It created some flexing of the ice shelf. And in no time, the ice shelf did that. It broke up. So there was like an ins almost instantaneous release of the support that the, that ice shelf was providing to those glaciers that were flowing into it. And they responded just the way the theory would have suggested they should. The glaciers sped up. They sped up. They started to thin. They started, you know, flowing out toward the ocean. But they also did something else. They started to back up into their fjords. So the flow increased. So you'd almost think that the glacier would almost want to advance back out into the ocean and reform an ice shelf. But for example, this one didn't. It actually, even though it was started flowing faster, the breaking, the physical breaking of the ice sheet, the generation of icebergs out, was outpacing the, the, the faster flow and the glacier retreated up into its fjord. So we've realized that there are brittle processes in the ice sheets that I, I think that we maybe haven't been paying enough attention to as we have been developing our models of these systems. And this is a bit of a step change in the community and thinking about other dynamics in the system that we might need to worry about. But again, this whole kind of scenario is triggered initially by the loss of the ice shelf because this doesn't happen if the ice shelf remains intact out here. That continues to provide support and everything's fine. There's slower flow and we don't have the really fast breaking. Okay, here are some examples of a couple of glaciers in Greenland that have lost their ice shelves. They're exhibiting very fast flow out into the sea and very fast breaking generation of icebergs. So we have some observational um, analogs from Greenland, we can start to think about how they would apply to Antarctica. Okay, now this, you know, has, has spawned some recent literature, very much trying to get into the detailed glaciological processes that would be going on at a very, very thick glacier reaching the ocean that suddenly loses its ice shelf and then has the potential to start to break. And if I can get both movies to sort of start to play simultaneously, these are two papers published in the last year, digging into these processes using um, completely independent and different modeling approaches to the problem. But you saw, you know, in this model to the right, that is essentially um, what we has been coined by the community as the, the possibility of a marine ice cliff instability, very rapid breaking of very, very thick glacial ice that has lost its ice shelf. And once one, one iceberg calves off, a piece of ice breaks, well now, because of that bowl-shaped basin idea, that means that the next piece of ice that breaks is going to be in thicker ice. And so you start breaking ice that gets thicker and thicker and thicker as you move back into the interior of the ice sheet. Okay, so this is an important slide because this shows the difference in our future projections of what the Antarctic ice sheet in West Antarctica in, in particular might do in the future with, with if we ignore these brittle processes or we try to include them. And so you're seeing three different emission scenarios, sort of a low, the top RCP 2.6, sort of a, a maybe slightly less than a, a two degrees C future world by the end of the century, sort of a Paris Agreement, sort of aspirational scenario. This is sea level contributed just by Antarctica. And in this case, most of this is coming from West Antarctica in, in, these, in these model simulations. And the, um, the axis here is in meters. And you can see that, um, even by the year 2300, you know, roughly ballpark one meter sort of um, scale in terms of what might be predicted by these models with these processes included. 
Down here on the bottom right is a very high emissions, right? More extreme emissions scenario, more of a business as usual, not even the, the so-called nationally determined contributions that um, were agreed to it at Paris, but a high emission scenario. You can see it's a very, very different picture. Meters of sea level rise coming from Antarctica on, you know, over the course of a few centuries. Now, this line, this black line down here, that's the same model without these brittle processes included, the breaking, the fracture, the iceberg generation in places where in the ice sheet has lost its buttressing ice shells. Completely different. Okay, now there was a really important you know, question just asked about the IPCC uh, um, and you know, future projections and, and we're gonna end on that. So keep this in mind, if these processes really are something that we need to be worrying about. We have witnessed them happen. There are observations of these processes happening. There's growing um, theoretical and computer modeling evidence that they might be something that we need to worry about. This is a huge amount of uncertainty. Should the IPCC and all of us be counting on a future with this kind of sea level coming from Antarctica or something like this? Okay, and a really, really important question for our community right now. We're trying to get a better handle on just that. Okay, but I will say that, um, you know, relative to this meeting and what we're all here to do is to try to have some positive influence on policy. When we do include those processes in a model and then look to see what happens to the West Antarctic ice sheet with incremental warming. So these are simulations that Emissions follow a tra trajectory in the top left where as soon as the, um, the world re reaches plus 1.5 relative degrees Celsius relative to pre-industrial, that's as warm as the world gets. We look to see how much ice is being lost from West Antarctica. The red line is the rate of sea level rise coming from Antarctica. Most of that's West Antarctica plus 1.5 degrees C. We're getting eight centimeters out of the entire ice sheet, both West and East Antarctica in the year 2100 in a plus 1.5 scenario. We follow a plus two degree scenario, the middle plot. There isn't much difference. Nothing dramatic has changed between plus 1.5 and plus two. We go to plus three degrees. So essentially following the current nationally determined contributions. And you can see what happens to the red line. It's a completely different storyline. By the end of the century, things really take off. And that's really dramatic retreat of the West Antarctic ice sheet, a combination of faster flow and more breaking, in particular of the um, part of the ice sheet that's drained by this Thwaites Glacier. Now, Thwaites Glacier, like relative to a Greenland counterpart, the big dramatic, um, you know, videos that you've probably seen of huge calving events in Greenland. And I, I sh actually showed you two photos of, of, of some of the uh, two iconic glaciers in, in Greenland, the Helheim and the Jakobshavn Glacier. They're very impressive glaciers, um, approaching a kilometer in thickness, between five, in, in the case of Jakobshavn, about 10 kilometers wide, huge system. Thwaites Glacier, is draining a basin, again, that is more than 2,000 meters deep. And the trunk of the glacier is about 120 kilometers wide, not 10 kilometers wide, like a big Greenland outlet glacier. Okay, so what's happening in this bottom right-hand scenario where the world has gone up to plus three is we're just starting to see summers around the margins of Antarctica, where the summer temperatures are just starting to flirt with or go just above freezing. And once you hit the freezing point, every one degree Celsius increase in temperature drives an exponential increase in the amount of meltwater that you generate on the surface of these ice shelves. So the ice shelves are flat, it means that once you hit a threshold of warming, 
you're suddenly now covering a huge area of these ice shelves where the temperatures are potentially a little bit above freezing in the summer, you're gonna to start to swamp them with meltwater. And again, that's this tipping point I would um, be worried about in terms of, of Antarctica's future. Where the ice is mainly coming from in this plus three degree scenario. And by the way, th this is an ensemble of simulations, the blues and the black. So the red is the rate of sea level rise being contributed by the ice sheet. And the black curve is the amount of sea level rise that the ice sheet has contributed. And you can see that the Antarctic ice sheet ends up contributing uh, uh, 15 centimeters or so in this plus three degrees C scenario, much, much more, you know, essentially double than the plus 1.5 degree scenario. Okay, this is where the action is. It's right where most of the mass loss is being generated today, where we think some of these processes might be on the verge of having begun. So we're going to concentrate on this sector of the ice sheet. In the year 2100, this is what things look like. You can see that there's been a retreat. Here, the Pine Island and the Thwaites Glacier, this is, this is all Thwaites Glacier draining back into the interior of the ice sheet. So you can see that there is an initial retreat there in the year 2100. But this is important. So now, in a plus three degree C globally warmed world, we're really getting into these summer temperatures in an area like this where we're starting to see more and more days that are going above freezing in the summertime. So it's really just after the turn of the century where things really begin to take off. So I, you know, we really need to have more than a 2100 perspective. 80 years is around the corner, folks. It's what happens just after this that becomes really interesting. So we're gonna jump ahead two more centuries to make it dramatic. And what, ha what has happened is that this Thwa Thwaites Glacier, through a combination of faster flow, retreating into the bowl, so the ice is getting thicker and thicker and thicker as it retreats, and it's beginning to break faster and faster and faster, basically you know, destroys the interior of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, generating, you know, uh, in this simulation, 154 centimeters of sea level rise in just a few centuries. And this is for a plus three degrees C. This is if the world follows the Paris Agreement nationally determined contributions to the letter of the law. So, you know, what I would conclude from that, and there's, there's a lot of uncertainty in this, the exact timing of when this would begin is not, you know, nailed down. It could be 2070, it could be 2150, it could be 2200. Um, nonetheless, you know, the take home message to me is that the current NDCs are not good enough. We have to do better than plus three degrees C by 2100. You know, we didn't see too much change at plus two degrees C. The ice sheet sort of continues to behave over this century very much the way that it is today without much of a, a change. Um, we could be wrong. I mean, uh, maybe the threshold is lower. But, uh, you know, this is some recent work suggesting that you go above plus two degrees C and you're really flirting with disaster. Okay, so a long, longer term perspective. If these brittle processes are going to be impacting a glacier like Thwaites that can actually lead to the instability of the whole West Antarctic ice sheet, in a very high emission scenario, in the low emission scenario, these processes really never kick in because the, the atmosphere never gets warm enough to make all this meltwater to break up the ice shelves. But in the higher emissions, it does get warm enough where we get meltwater that can break up the ice shelves. So, okay, this is a lot of sea level rise to be added on to Greenland and th sea level rise from thermal expansion and from uh, land water storage and so forth. High emission scenario, 34 centimeters coming from Antarctica would be the central estimate of a model that includes these, these brittle processes 
in the projections. But by the year 2200, you know, it's on the order of five meters of potential sea level rise. And, you know, you go out to the year 2300 and it's even more than that. So, you know, these sorts of levels of sea level literally remap the way that the planet looks from space. And Jonathan just, you know, showed some astounding figures in terms of the number of people impacted for much, much more obviously modest levels of sea level rise than what we'd be talking about here. So we certainly want to stay kind of in this 1.5 to plus two degrees C realm. And, you know, to me, like being here, the mission of the COP, you know, this to me is just such a clear case for um, making sure that we do not exceed plus 1.5 or at the very least plus two degrees C. Okay. Is this as is, is this as bad as it can get? You know, five meters of sea level rise coming from Antarctica, or ten meters by the year twenty three hundred. Could something even more extreme happen? And I have to say, I think that this is not the most extreme. And the reason why I say that is that the rate of the ice loss in these simulations it has a speed limit that has been applied. And that speed limit is based on the rate of ice loss that we see in big glaciers draining Greenland. But as I said a few minutes ago, the big glaciers draining the Greenland ice sheet, even the biggest ones are really small in comparison to the, mag the scale of a glacier like the Thwaites Glacier in West Antarctica. The ice is has the potential in the future if it starts to back up into this deep, bowl-shaped basin to become way thicker than the glaciers draining the Greenland ice sheet and much, much wider. Thicker ice, no buttressing because there's no ice shelf, means a lot of stress in the ice that can make the ice break, maybe even faster than the rate that the ice has observed to break in Greenland. So all we're really saying at the end of the day of these really dramatic projections of what Antarctica might do in terms of sea level in the future, this is saying if Antarctica and its, it's really big outlet glaciers really just begin to behave like their smaller brothers and sister glaciers in Greenland, these are the kinds of numbers in terms of the rates of sea level rise that could be produced. If Antarctic glaciers, because of their scale, size, they're draining into the open ocean, um, their lack of buttressing, their lack of um, um, narrow fjords to have little bits of uh, broken up icebergs to get jammed to ha help provide a little support. You know, you'd have to think that these much, much bigger Antarctic systems could potentially even do something faster than the Greenland counterparts. So this could in some ways be conservative in terms of the, um, the estimates of sea level rise that this particular model is producing. Okay, so ending on this slide. So this sort of wrapped up the previous discussion as to like, what do we make of this? So, you know, to date, there's been one model that has incorporated these processes, just one, at, a, at an ice sheet scale to try to say something about what they might mean for the future. So it was really great to see that in the just recent release of the IPCC AR6, this is a figure from, their summer, from the summary for policymakers. The bottom panel is their sort of summary graphic for sea level rise. And what it's showing are their projections for future sea level, their best guess, their central estimates, the 50th percentile of their probabilities these solid lines in this bottom graph. And the details of the numbers really aren't that important. The, the blue projections are for the lower emission scenarios and you see the red projection is for the highest emission scenario that was considered. And then the range, the colors that are around the, the discrete lines would be the so-called likely range of the projections, the 17th to the 83rd percentile in the, in the probabilities. Okay, and you can see that in the year 2100, 
you know, one meter or more of sea level rise, you know, from Greenland plus Antarctica plus thermal expansion is within the likely range of the higher emission scenarios. That, you know, in 80 years would be devastating in and of itself. But then there's this red dash line. And this was the way that the IPCC handled, you know, the possibility that maybe some of these new, they're not new mechanisms because we've known about them, we've studied them for a long time, but really, you know, the first time considered is actually, okay, what do they mean for the Antarctic ice sheet? They, they treated that, you know, not by trying to figure out a way to incorporate that dashed red line within the main body of the projections, but sort of as just kind of an outlier. And they're calling it a low likelihood. So, you know, that's the perspective that it's not likely that these processes are gonna kick in. Um, but if they did, it would be a high impact, obviously storyline. But you can see that there is a possibility that there will be outcomes for sea level because of a really rapid loss of ice from the West Antarctic ice sheet mainly that lie way outside the likely range of the primary projections that we collectively and the world are using to make important policy decisions. And I really think that, you know, we need to maybe come up with an even better way to consider and incorporate the possibility of something like this red dash line happening. And of course, this just goes essentially off the chart as we go further out in time, which is an important thing to, to remember. Okay, I am going to leave it there and would um, love to hear some questions or any thoughts. So thanks for a, very, a really interesting talk, Rob. Uh, could we, do we have any questions online or from the floor? You have a question? Yes, come, come and ask a question. <laughs> Hi, Rob. Uh, great to meet you, having incorporated uh, some of your work in the IPCC report. Um, so similar question to Jonathan, actually. I'm still, you, you know, I, there's lots of gaps, there's lots of uncertainties. You know, Antarctica is a big question. I, mean, I still kind of think Jonathan's was a bit of a cop-out answer. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm asking you how you would spend the money. Um, to, like, are you going to spend it on modelling, or do we need to install early warning systems around Thwaites Glacier, or are there, you know, what are we going to do? <laughs> I love it. I, you know, modelling is cheap. <laughs> so, is that what you said? Is modelling is cheap? So there, there is a. You know, I, I look at this and I, okay. And I'm like, I'm, I'm looking at this, the International Space Station go by at night. I'm thinking about, okay, where, where are our priorities? You know, an outcome like that, if that, if there's even a tiny, a 1%, 2%, 5%, we're all wearing masks, right? Okay, I'm not because I'm speaking because there's, there's a very low probability that we're gonna, you're gonna have a breakthrough case and get COVID. And if, if, if I knew that there was a 10% chance, let's say, of that happening to have come to the COP, I would, you know, I probably, I don't know if I would even come. You certainly are not taking your masks off. And now we're saying maybe there's a five, I don't know, a 10% probability that some outcome like this could produce catastrophic outcomes for the world and the population. And yet, as Jonathan noted earlier, there are just a, a few modeling groups right now that are studying this, trying to get into the details of this. I, you know, part of the problem is I'm not even sure it's money, it's um, it's capacity. You know, we need to be training more students, like making this kind of science exciting, so that everybody is breaking down the door, wanting to be our graduate students and to learn this stuff and to take it to the next level. That will in part drive the science because the, you know, our, our funding agencies will be flooded with proposals. But still at the end of the day, even if we were able to increase our capacity for modeling and studying the theory and the supercomputing, 
an order of magnitude higher level than today, it's still relatively cheap science. It's the, it's the challenges of getting the observations, um, international coordination in field programs. It's still a really difficult place in the world to get to. There are more people have been in space than have like had physical contact with the Thwaites Glacier. And yet it is, you know, it has been coined in like some of the American press is the so-called doomsday glacier. And uh, it is understudied. I love the idea of early warning where, you know, of course, you know, we can do our best, the best we can with remote sensing and satellites to, to study the system. But I think on the ground in situ coordinated multinational efforts studying the, you know, the oceanography around the glacier, the atmospheric climate, the meteorology, critical. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm not a climate scientist, but I find this all very interesting and of course concerning. I was just interested, is there any way, obviously it's probably unrealistic, but is there any way in which the ice sheets would start reforming? Is that a stupid question? No, not just stop. Would they? Could they ever start reforming? Like, if we if we got the temperature of the Earth down enough. <laughs> really good question. So, really great question. So, the question I you all heard it. I was barely able to hear it without headphones. But so, once you know these processes, let's say, began to kick in, are they reversible? And because what triggers these processes at the end of the day is the loss of the ice shelves. That's the key ingredient because now we don't have that support anymore. You would really need ice shelves to be able to reform, to stop or slow down the process, to start to provide some support to let the ice sheet recover and, and actually march its way back out into the ocean again. The problem is that if the, you know, once the world has reached a threshold where it's warm enough to make melt water on the surface of the ice shelf to break it up in the first place. As long as it's still that warm, then if an ice shelf tries to reform, it's gonna get covered with melt water again the next year, right? And, and, and break up. In the oceans, you know, the oceans are absorbing about 90% of the heat that we're, you know, have contributed to, to putting into the earth system. That's been good in a way that we have this big thermal buffer on the earth to absorb, you know, the heating that's being caused by these extra greenhouse gases. But um, it's a buffer because it's taking a long time for the oceans to warm up. But there's a flip side to that coin. That means that the oceans are gonna take a long time to cool down again. And because the ice shelves are in contact with the ocean, ice shelves are not going to want to be able to reform until the oceans cool back down again to a point where they're able to because a little bit of warm water attacks these ice shelves from the bottom side at a very rapid rate. A little bit of warming goes a long way. Uh, you know, just like you watching your ice cube melt in a gin and tonic, right? You know that, right, it doesn't last very long. So we have looked into this and I, I actually showed this earlier today. What happens if you just start to trigger these processes and then we find a way magically to reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and go back to a pre-industrial like climate? The atmosphere, as CO2 goes down, cools. There's a pretty quick response in the atmospheric temperatures, but the ocean stays warm for a long time. And so even though we turn down CO2 again, once these processes kick in, we can slow them down a little bit, but they don't reverse. And they still go faster than they would have in the first place. So we're finding irreversibility once these mechanisms kick in. And that's a, it's a really important question you ask because it means that even science fiction like geoengineering, like we don't have the technology right now to scrub carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere at scale at the rate that would be required to do something like that. And even if we did, the models are suggesting it's not gonna matter once it gets the world gets warm enough and the oceans have absorbed enough heat. 
it's another reason to just say, we just leave the fossil fuel on the ground because even if we find a way to pull it out of the atmosphere again, not going to have that much of an impact. It'll be too late. Yes, hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I, th I think you uh, heard you saying that uh, the actual NDCs are not enough not to go over three degrees. Can you elaborate a little bit, a bit more on that a bit more? So this is why I'm saying the NDCs aren't good enough, is that you see these red lines. This is sea level coming from Antarctica, plus 1.5, plus two. You see there's not much change in that red line. Plus three, you see the big change. And that big change is happening because, again, it's getting just warm enough. The oceans are warm. It's a combination of the oceans getting just warm enough in the summers around in West Antarctica beginning to make some meltwater that triggers these processes, kicks things off. So we want to stay, we want to do better than this. The question is, are you sure, I mean, not you, but uh, is in a study saying that current NDCs uh, will reach to a more than 3%, not the effect it has, this causes. Is it's, it's a study you have made that the current NDCs will, will get to more than three degrees? So the question is, is it really, or do, do the NDCs really just, do they produce plus three degrees in the year 2100 or something potentially even more? That number has been going up and down. You can track it at climateactiontracker.com all the time. Um, I know it was 2.7 degrees a few months ago, then it was 3.1, I don't know what it is right now, but it, it's roughly plus three degrees. Another question? Hello, thank you for your insertion. I would like to know, uh, would you define the rate, given the rate and the scale, that we got a tipping point at this moment? Uh, would you consider the situation a tipping point? Yes, yes. Yeah. So these, these are really wonderful questions. So are, are we already at a tipping point? I, you know, I guess it, you know, Antarctica is increasingly contributing to sea level rise today. The last decade, we saw roughly a threefold increase in the rate of ice loss relative to the decade before. Things are definitely beginning to spin up. We're observing that happening. Um, I don't expect the, that sort of, I think that the ice sheet will probably increasingly contribute to sea level rise. But, you know, I guess I, it, it becomes semantics in terms of what we're talking about as a tipping point. If the ice sheet continues to behave the way we're observing it now, um, you know, we're still talking about additional stress on our global coastlines. But, you know, sort of like these red, these red curves where, you know, like today, sea level will be rising at a pace that is um, causing challenges around the world, but hopefully, potentially, as of today, um, in many places, still manageable in terms of engineering and geoengineering. So the roughly four millimeters per year of global sea level rise that we're seeing today, you know, okay. I'm not sure what you would call a threshold, but to me, the threshold is, you know, thinking about like an order magnitude sort of increase in the pace. And these, this mechanism and some of these results that I just showed, we would be measuring global mean sea level, not in millimeters per year, but in centimeters per year. And um, when you get er into the early 22nd century, so let's say, I don't know, maybe 2150 or so, um, you know, the model is producing five centimeters or so of sea level rise per year, just from the Antarctic component. 
I mean, I'm not, uh, how do you deal with that in terms of um, engineering at the coast? I think it becomes managed retreat at that point, right? A really, really different. So that to me is what I would consider a tipping point, not maybe a little bit of an uptick in the, in the rate of sea level rise, but something like that, order magnitude. We want to avoid that. Maybe we have another question. Thank you. I learned a lot at this session. Um, I was wondering, you went over some of the uh, some of the differences in what we would see if the Greenland ice melts more than the West Antarctica and vice versa. Is, is it currently um, predicted to go one way or the other? Or is there a way that you know um, or are trying to know which way it's going to go? So Greenland versus Antarctica, you know, again, today it's, it's, it's all about Greenland. It's contributing more than twice the amount of sea level rise than Antarctica. If these processes, if we're right about these processes that are put into this one particular model are correct, then at some point Antarctica takes over and begins to way outpace Greenland. That, you know, doesn't begin to happen. The possibility of that, we're still talking about the end of this century. So we don't have to worry about that, I don't think, over the next few decades. It's more sort of the tail end of this century. And, you know, it's like, if we can get back to that image of Greenland versus West Antarctica, right? It's who the, the winners and the losers are. So, you know, there are stars here where I come from, that's Boston. So if, if Greenland ends up contributing a meter to sea level rise at some point in the future, Boston will feel 35 centimeters of that. The global average will be a meter, Boston will feel 35 centimeters. So that would be, you know, good for a Bostonian. It would not be so good for someone living in um, Argentina where they would feel more. And again, vice versa, um, Boston feels, you know, 125 cent centimeters rather than 100 centimeters, you know, um, if that one meter comes from West Antarctica. So this is, you know, right now the map is leaning more toward the one on the left, but it could end up jumping to looking more like the one on the right in terms of the red zones and the hot spots. And I, you know, I think by the end of this century that we're going to see a bigger contribution from Antarctica. And it'll be more like the red map. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Oh, come out. Hi, sorry, I came late, but um, so I was there behind you. Um, looking at the difference between those two maps, this might be quite a cynical question, but do you think if we were more likely to see a map that's more like the one on the right with more sea level rise in the Northern Hemisphere, sea level rise would be a bigger issue in climate change policy? Um, do you think sea level rise might have been a larger part of the conversation in, in climate change policy if we were more likely to see more sea level rise in the Northern Hemisphere than in the Southern? So there was a... Um my graduate student, Shana Sadai, who is here in the audience, she, at the end of my previous talk, she talked about some of the climate justice issues with this. And, and there are others in addition to this. So the question, right, that, I mean, you know, sadly, probably if there were people, where's the power? You know, I, I suppose is the question. Um, you see big impacts in, places like New York and LA and San Francisco. Um, and here we see, you know, big impacts in, in other places in the world. There are some serious um, climate justice issues that, that come into play. But the policies that were talked about at Paris, for example, were not thinking about these maps. And if they had been, I really can't say, I, you know, 
I'd like to think that it would have sparked some um, important dialogue about um, justice and fairness in terms of policy. Okay. Um, would you like to join me in thanking both our speakers today for this session? Thank you. And uh, before you go, we have coming up at 6 p.m., we have a session on Antarctica and the limits of adaption, if you want to stay around for that. Thank you. <laughs>